let's say you want to find out how many feet there are, you know, like walking feet, like at the end of your legs, mm-hmm. in Florida, right? So you can go through the whole state and count everybody's feet. And there's 3,000 feet or whatever. Now you want to know how many. Um, so then you say, okay, I don't want to count everybody's feet. So I'm going to say every person who has a foot has a shoe. And every shoe has a shoelace. So I'm not going to count the feet. I'm going to count the shoelaces because mm-hmm. that's easier. Yeah. And that's going to tell me how many feet there are. And that's true, except some people have feet, but they don't have shoes. And some people have feet, but they have three pairs of shoes. And some shoes don't have shoelaces. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, you cannot use the shoelace argument to say how many people have feet or how many feet there are. And the guy who invented the test they're using with coronavirus called a RT-PCR test said, unless you have a gold standard, like the meningococcus, you cannot use this for diagnostic purposes. Mm -hmm. It's a surrogate test. Yes. But the people who have, quote, coronavirus, they have a fever and a cough. So Mm -hmm. that could be anything. Yes. They haven't isolated the virus. And some of the people who have fever and a cough have a virus. Mm -hmm. Some of the people who have the virus have nothing. And so you can't make any prediction as to whether a looking for a, a piece that's supposedly unique to the virus has any comment on whether they're actually sick from that. Mm-hmm. But the, the really scary part of this is the way the test is done, they take a piece that's supposedly unique to that virus mm-hmm. and they accentuate it through cycles, 20 cycles, 40 cycles, because they can't find it just with one. Mm-hmm. And if you get it up to 60 cycles, you find it with everybody. Mm-hmm. So it's not unique to that virus. No. So, but if you, f- if you do it 35 cycles, right. then you don't find it with anybody. So you can actually, by choosing the number of cycles, yes. you can choose how many people will test positive. Right. And would you agree that even if you find the, the virus present in any human or any human with a set of symptoms like fever or respiratory uh, distress, it doesn't prove causality. That No, it could be an excretion of the cell. Right. There could be excretion of the cell. There's an infinite number of factors that go into producing a symptom in a specific individual. So this whole model is, is really absurd on, on a really basic level. Right. Well, right. Um, and when you do that and when you don't know whether it's the causative agent or maybe there is, is no such thing in that context as a causative agent, maybe it's just a message. You can't use a surrogate marker in that case. Yes. And the problem then, if the, if, the, if the false positive rate, if you do 40 cycles is 1% mm-hmm. and you go test 20, 20 million people, oh, next my. thing you know, you have 200,000 people test positive and you've right. got an epidemic. Right. Well, what David uh, Crow did in his recent article on is yeah. coronavirus 19 real? is showed that originally in China, they were using uh, criteria such as possible exposure to someone who had been diagnosed with the infection as a a way to confirm a case. But when they started quarantining and there weren't more cases to associate with, the the numbers just went down to, you know, just basically dropped off the cliff. So it's all been through, you know, just completely non-evidence-based criteria that they've been identifying. You know, and the virome and, and study metagenomic studies of just the human guts and even the blood are showing that many of these deadly viruses, so to speak, like flu and coronavirus and herpes viruses, are actually naturally present. They're they're part of our fundamental right. makeup, and therefore this concept. I, I was going to write this article about how. You know, are, should we cons- be concerned about a weaponized germ? Because I think there's legitimate um, history to show that, yes, there are these yeah. secure facilities that ostensibly to protect against biowarfare de- have developed these strains. 
but I think it's more weaponized germ theory that we are most concerned about as a geopolitical control system um, because of what we're seeing already with forced quarantines. I mean, we're looking at now Spain and France and Italy and, and potentially soon the U.S. will be on house arrest yeah. uh, with the National Guard outside with guns. And that's really something that I think people need to understand that this isn't just an academic discussion. Um, actually, when you really look down into to this, like we are doing with these testing um, uh, methodologies, there's very little evidence there at all that, that they work. Yeah. And they, they, you can manipulate the numbers to get to get more false positives and then you have an epidemic and then you can give people a vaccine and then you can lower the numbers and then see you got rid of the epidemic. <laughs> and all you did was change the number of, of cycles that you went through and you'll change the numbers. Absolutely. I mean, you know what, I explain this to people, uh, at least my view, I, you know, I try to give people an imagination of this. And the two that I came up with is, because we're talking about, um, you know, there are people who are getting sick and they do have degenerative cells, right? Their mm -hmm. cells are degenerating and they're showing more DNA than they probably should uh, pooping out of their cells, right? You mean, so the question then is what's poisoning them? Well, this is such an important point you're making because when you look at, for example, conventional, you know, standard of care for things like influenza, they're using Tamiflu, which is a chemical that has profound hydrogenic consequences, uh, yeah. many of which overlap with cardiorespiratory failure, which is primary, you know, diagnosis of death from this, quote, type of viral um, exposure. So what you're looking at is with the introduction now, fast tracking and um, approval of HIV drugs for this pandemic is we're going to start to see that the, the poisoning they lay on top of an original chronic poisoning is going to be associated with a invisible germ called coronavirus. So it's, um, right. you're going to see this potential. And then they die. And who knows if it's because they were sick or because they got poisoned twice. Yeah, and then I think also when you have these scary Ebola-like outfits and you have this theater, you know, this political theater, we also have the bone-pointing concept, which is like a shaman in some, you know, uh, ancient culture pointing a bone at a member of the tribe and saying, you'll die tomorrow, you're cursed, and the yeah. person believes them and they die. And so we're seeing that, I think, on a mass scale. In fact, some of the people that we know in this space are getting upset at individuals like myself who do not believe that the threat is as severe as CNN says or the CDC or the WHO. And they're starting to attack individuals who aren't afraid because so it's, it's almost like there's a dehumanization process at play that is more concerning than any virus would ever be. Yeah. Well, I think, it, again, a lot of this is speculation because we don't know. Um, at least I don't know, but I have a, I have a, I have a feeling based on my understanding of the history of flu pandemics that they're all associated with an increase in electrification of the earth, uh, and there's something about a new electro electromagnetic field exposure that actually deteriorates the DNA and causes this excessive budding, which we call viruses. And that, that is actually a big problem. Wow. Like we have a problem. Yes. And we see people who are deteriorated and they started it in Wuhan and on this cruise ship. Mm -hmm. and I think that this story was partly a kind of, it's, it's a little bit like the Patsy thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we yes. know this is going to happen. We know that whenever we roll out radio waves and radar and yeah. there's a, flu epidemic it's not yeah. a viral flu it's a poisoning of the dna in particular for whatever reason the deterioration of the dna in the cell from an electromagnetic field exposure that you're not used to mm -hmm. makes you look like you have a viral infection and i mean again wow. i don't you know i don't have all the answers or the facts here but 
my guess is we do have a problem. Yes. That, but it's a it's it's the who puts some shit in the water problem. Yeah. In this case, it's not the water; it's the the electromagnetic field of the Earth. And somebody just recently yes. put some heavy shit in our water, or well, I mean, you, our field. We know that at sixty uh, gigahertz, the the oxygen molecule. I mean, it absorbs what ninety eight percent of the radiation. Yeah. But you know, clearly, micro. Okay, like I like to explain to people that. Their microwaves emit 2.4 gigahertz or 2.45 gigahertz waveforms. That's the Bluetooth standard. That's what Wi-Fi is on. The yeah. same wavelengths that we cook food by heating the water molecules are being used in these devices. So it, it doesn't take a big leap in logic to assume that's going to affect our constitution. 99% of the molecules by number are water, as of course we know. Um, so... And, you know, there's this notion that biomass of the cell is really an epiphenomenon, right? The cell is an electromagnetic entity and there's an electron. And, and so we, we think about it as almost like as just emissions from the cell, but it's the other way around. Is the biomass, what we consider real, these biomolecules are in a way secondary expressions of this really these, these 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 vibrations that's that's fundamentally right. so and obviously the water piece that you're bringing into force so powerful in understanding how this all connects um so we're looking at non-native emf and looking at our bodies as water electromagnetic this view is profound that you're introducing i will say that i think that you may be absolutely correct that especially if the proxy marker for coronavirus mm -hmm testing with PCR is RNA levels without specificity. And these are a reflection of cell debris caused by damage, yeah. exogenous damage. Well, then uh, obviously, like you're saying, this could be a patsy. This could just be, you know, a red herring or whatever you will.